Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Hallelujah. So, uh, just while, while Leanne is uh, doing a little setup here, um, do we have any praise reports? Testimonies of praise. Somebody want to shout a victory. God is good. That's right, Natanya. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I want to read something. I, I sent this to uh, some friends. There are two vital conditions for prayer. Abiding his in, excuse me, abiding in Christ and his word abiding in us. Reinhard Bonnke. He was the uh, known as the Billy Graham of Africa. Saw seventy eight million more than that, but since he was recording, seventy eight million come to Christ. Uh, recorded. recorded. Before that we, we don't know. But his organization still going on. Um, I did get a little newsletter that they're going to do some a lot of heavy training and they're going to go to like 10 different um, major cities to preach and, and teach. So um, I just want to pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you, Jesus, our everlasting Father. No witchcraft, no rebellion, no divination, no anxiety, no care. Nothing is going to interfere the, the blood, but meeting and dwelling place here in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, anoint this time. The, we are frail. We are weak. We are not possible. Because with man, nothing is impossible. Nothing is possible with man. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus, I just, I thank you for your great love. We love because you first loved us. You who died for your enemies. Thank you, Jesus. I ask that you would open your word to our hearts. Open the, open the eyes of our hearts that our hearts may understand and receive what you give to us in Jesus name Amen, Amen. so thank you um, I am so happy so so happy to see our family grow and join together and I, I hope you guys don't mind that I feel that you all are family um that's what we're supposed to be, right? The family of God, right? So when we became believers, God put a new spirit in our heart and he put his, he washed us with his blood and now we have his holy DNA in us and that's what joins us together. The blood of Messiah. Praise the Lord. Um, we're going to be sort of hopping around today, but we're going to start in Revelation. Um, I called this SEAL training. I, I thought this was um, amazing. Revelation is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. We talked about that last week. This is all about getting a view of who Christ is and how that affects us as individuals. Um, how that affects us. Uh, and our relationship with him, how we respond to him, and um, and you know what his goal for us is. So several weeks ago, this all sort of started as we talked about. Um, it came out of a desire to do a discipleship class, and um, we wanted to start back at the beginning. And the beginning was God creating us. And he created us perfect and holy and and um, for himself. And he invited us into communion with himself. Remember, he walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. And that's a picture of his desire 
to be with us. And when he created us, he created us so that we would look like him. And we talked about how that was. There was a, you know, God is spirit, so we had a spirit. In fact, he gave us his very breath inside our body. That was the spirit part. And then he um, created us with a frame, and that was our body, so that we could interact in this material world. We had to be material to interact with the material world. And so uh, this is how we perceive the earth. And then when he blew breath, his breath, into our material body, something new was created, and that was the soul. And that soul has within it our identity, what we think, what we feel, uh, what we like, what we dislike, um, how we reason, and our will to do stuff. And we talked about how this was all perfectly aligned. There was nothing out of balance or order. Um, and it was in relationship with God because man and God, they walked together and communed with each other and talked with one another and worked together perfectly. And that's the way he created us to be. There was no doubts or fears or insecurities or anything. Adam was perfectly accepted. Eve was perfectly accepted. And they lived in this place of security where food was provided and shelter was there. And they didn't have much need of shelter. There was no deluges or coldness or anything. Everything was perfect. And then sin happened. And this relationship with God, because this is what sin does, it separates. Now, God was not connected to man because his spirit, it says in the Bible, it died. Which means, biblically speaking, death is a separation of. Even in our physical body, according to medical doctors, your body dies when that personality part of you is separated from the physical part of you. The shell is left. But your identity is gone somewhere. They can't tell you where. I could tell you where. But they can't. Okay? From a spiritual aspect, you die spiritually when your spirit is disconnected from God. You die. And this was a major problem. Because once this happened... Then we had an introduction of, you know, Eve wanted that, tr that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she got the, she already had the good, she didn't realize she was only going to get the evil. She was going to get an understanding of evil. So now for the first time they dealt with fear, like we were afraid of you God, so we went and hid. They dealt with guilt. They dealt with insecurity. For the first time ever, they felt naked and ashamed. They never felt those things before. But now all of a sudden, they were intimately aware that there was a lack for them. And they began to try to satisfy those things on the, in themselves. Remember, they sewed big leaves together and all this stuff. Okay, so at this moment, when sin enters into the world, and God's precious, loved, cherished, treasured creation was stolen from him. Because, why were they stolen? Because Satan came in and deceived Eve. And if you want to take one step back, God created man as part of his soul with a will. Because he created him in the image of himself. You see, God chose to love us even while we rebelled against him. He has a will. And he chose to extend his love towards us, regardless of what we do, regardless of how we do it. And so when he created us in his own image, it says, let us make man in our own image. So he made man in the image of God. So he gave us a will. We chose to do life our own way. And if he hadn't have given us a will, we would have been a whole bunch of robots. Instead of, or animals, instead of being people in the image and likeness of God. So this will was very, very important that he allow us the ability to make mistakes. We unfortunately made the mistakes. But God knew, it says before the foundations of the earth he knew, and so he chose to put in effect 
a plan that he had already figured out and already had going for a reconnection here. And that was through the cross, right? So I know this is review, but just bear with me. Because this is the story of the ages. We had, in fact, it's on there. I'm sorry. I am talking and we're not even moving. That's my fault. I did, I tried to do little slides. They're not, we're just going to have to find them. I'm sorry. I'm not used to using PowerPoint. Okay, so we had paradise, then we lost paradise, and then God redeemed paradise, paradise redeemed, because God became a man. He walked like us, he talked with us, he experienced life just like us, including death just like us. He had to learn obedience, it says, that he had to learn obedience, he had to suffer. But as God, he overcame what we could never overcome. We could never overcome death because he did it all perfectly. Because he did it perfectly, he was risen out of the grave. And he walked now in a newness of life. It says that he put off the in, the corruptible, that is the body which is subject to sin, which was going to decompose. And he put on an incorruptible body. And we, if we believe in Christ, will do the same exact thing. Your body someday will die. But at some point, after that death, you will put on a new body that will never, ever die, just like Christ. He was raised victorious over Satan's domain, and he was exalted to the right hand of God the Father in power and with authority because he overcame Satan. This is beautifully described in Revelation 20. Then I saw a mighty angel descending from the heavenly realms holding a heavy chain and a key. Um, oops, I'm reading in the wrong spot. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a good portion too. You should read it later. No, no, no. This is... It's where there is the battle in heaven. Oh, that's 12. That's is that 12? 12? Yeah. 12, 12. Fabulous. Thank you. It's, it's oh, it's on the board. If I read my slide, I'd know. <laughs> How quaint. It's all that planning that I did. All right, a terrible war broke out. That's the part. Uh, so Revelation 12, 7 through 12. A terrible war broke out of heaven and... Michael and his angels fought against the great dragon, which is uh, Satan. The dragon and his angels fought back, but the dragon did not have the power to win, and they could not regain their place in heaven. So the great dragon was thrown down once and for all. He is called the serpent, the ancient snake, called the devil and Satan, or the adversary, who deceives the whole earth. He was cast down into the earth and his angels along with him. And then I heard a triumphant voice in heaven proclaiming, Now, Salvation and power are set in place, and the kingdom reign of our God and the ruling authority of his anointed one are established. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who relentlessly accused them day and night before our God, has now been defeated, cast out once and for all. And they conquered him completely through the blood of the Lamb and the powerful word of his testimony. They triumphed because they did not love and cling to their own lives, even when faced with death. So rejoice, you heavens and every heavenly being, but woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great fury because he knows his time is short. And so there's this huge cosmic war that's going on. There is a, a war between God and his adversary, the kingdom of God that he created back here when he made everything perfect before the fall, that's what he is going back to. Redemption was part of that plan. Sending Christ as a man to walk the road of man, to speak the words of God and provide witness to who God is, was part of that plan. He died so that we can be identified with him and leave off all of this old Adam, this stuff that we were born into. The world system that was corrupted, that we were born into. We could get rid of this and not live in that any longer. Hallelujah. That was the plan. 
and then not just stay dead. I mean, it's no good if you just stay dead. He was going to, according to Ezekiel, he was going to give us this this old spirit he's going to get rid of. And he was going to give us a new spirit, it said, that would be connected to God. And he would give us a heart that is of flesh. Now, that's very interesting. He doesn't say exactly a new heart. It's a heart of flesh, one that's able, as opposed to a heart of stone. That was the comparison he was making. You see, before, we just were stuck in a sin cycle. We try and try and try, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail. It's a horrible sin cycle and very depressing. And some people throw their hands up and walk away from God completely because they get so frustrated with the try, fail, sin cycle. So he gives us a heart of flesh that will be able to win. Isn't that awesome? He restores our ability to win. And Revelation is largely dealing with this idea of winning the war for the soul. If you want to think of it this way, the body that you live in right now is condemned. It's going to die. Sorry. Some of you young people might not think too much about that. But you're going to die someday. Your spirit is going to live. Because it is God's. If you are aligned to him. If he's your Lord and Savior. He's given you a new spirit. And he has sealed it with your ho- with the Holy Spirit. You know, that's something that Adam and Eve didn't apparently have. They didn't have that sealing. But if you read the New Testament, it tells us that we are sealed by His Holy Spirit. Just as that grave tomb was sealed by the ruling authority to try to keep everybody out of that tomb. Of course, the human sealing didn't do much. It didn't stand in the face of God and His power. But when God seals you, you're sealed forever. Okay, so our spirit is sealed, our body is condemned, that leaves this area. This soul area, it's contested. That's where the war zone is. It's for your soul. And you know it. Should I eat the cake? Should I not eat the cake? I don't know. Should I steal the thing? Should I not steal the thing? Should I tell the lie? Should I not tell the lie? Should I get up? Should I not get up? And you fight with yourself. That fighting is this contested area. Right? God wants you to win here. So he gave you a heart of flesh that would be able to follow in his ways. But he didn't just give you a heart of flesh. It says in that same prophet's passage in Ezekiel, I'll find it and put it up there at some point. Is it 30? Ezekiel 36. 36. Uh, 30, that sounds about right. Sixteen. You guys find it. You'll got it. get it faster than I will. He said that he would put his spirit within you. This is a major addition to Adam and Eve. 36. Ezekiel 36. 26. There you go. That he would put his spirit within you, and that spirit would cause you to... Be able to do the statutes and the ordinances that God has put before you. So not only were you in your physicality able to do it, like in your being, but he's going to give you what Jesus calls later on a counselor or a helper to enable you to do it. He has given you, according to Peter, everything necessary for you to walk in godliness. There is victory on the horizon for you. There is victory on the horizon. Okay, let's see what the next one says. All right, so convinced that God can be known, and by known I mean in a hands-on kind of fashion, not known in your brain. Okay, there's a difference. Known by experience, like he can talk to you, he can guide you, he can show you things and teach you the way in which you need to go. That kind of known. That God can be known and that knowing will take them back to Eden. Back to that place where all your needs are met for significance. Why am I here on this earth? Security in your physicality, in your being, knowing that you're going to have a place, everything that you need is going to be taken care of, 
and acceptance. God's not going to reject you. Jesus said it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you till the end of the age. By the way, that was just a restatement of what God told his people back in Exodus. I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to go with you. They begin the journey of following Christ with the goal of becoming like him. Okay? They identify themselves in his death. I had a, an old Adam nature. It is now dead. That's not me anymore. It's buried. All my past is buried. That wasn't me. I was an addict. I'm not anymore. I was an offender. I'm not anymore. I was a liar. I'm not anymore. I'm a new creation. I was rejected, but I'm not anymore. I'm accepted. I was unlovely, but now I'm loved. And his resurrection life. This is what we live in. The power of the resurrection. I love the song that says, The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in me. It's the same power. It's the Holy Spirit. And he lives in me. Whether you raise a dead man, Back to life certainly can help me, right? And that's what he does for every person. He raises every time someone comes and says, Lord, I want you to be my Lord and Master and Savior. That's what he does. He he resurrects you. And his reigning power and eternal perspective from the heavenly places. We're identified in that too. It says that we are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. And so not just in power, but also his perspective. And if you look at Revelation carefully, you'll see most of it's written from heaven's perspective. And what heaven sees as, wow, victory, earth sees as stink, tragedy. So catch that subtle nuance. Where is John speaking from? Because when he speak, where he's speaking from will tell you how to look at what he's talking about. All right, let's go next. So, God desires for us to have eternal life. That was always the plan. But what's eternal life? According to John 17, it says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, that would be God the Father, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. And once again, knowing is by experience. It's not something that you can just do. Like, if I met you for the first time on the street, and you told me your name, and I told you mine, I wouldn't know you. I just have met you. Knowing involves a walking with, and experiencing life with. A deepening, ever deepening, learning and growing. That's the kind of knowing that God wants with you. Can you get your head around that? He wants to know you. Well, actually, he already knows you because he made you. But he wants you to know him. And this whole book of Revelation is about coming to know him progressively, his revealing of who he is. Paradise reclaimed. Here's the end. Spoiler alert. Revelation 21, 1-7. This is from the Passion Translation, and I took a little bit out just to make it fit together better. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of the heavenly realm from the presence of God, like a pleasing bride that had been prepared for her husband, adorned for her wedding. Look, God's tabernacle is with human beings, and from now on he will tabernacle with them as their God. Now, God himself will have his home with them. God with them will be their God. God with them. Emmanuel, the name of Yeshua, right, of Jesus. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and eliminate death entirely. No one will mourn or weep any longer. The pain of wounds will no longer exist, for the old order has ceased. And God enthroned spoke to me and said, Consider this, I am making everything to be new and fresh. Each word is trustworthy and dependable. I am the Aleph and the Tav, or the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to all who are thirsty as my gracious gift. 
they will continuously drink from the fountain of living water. The conquering ones will inherit these gifts from me, and I will continue to be their God, and they will continue being children for me. This is paradise reclaimed. This is what he wanted for us. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out, and I've said it before. God always deals with us in two ways. One is on the individual level. That's the bride. And the corporate level. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a city, right? Made up of the bride. So it's always two. You can look at this individually, and you can look at it as the body of Messiah. Okay? He is seeking to bring restoration and ultimately to dwell with us. He wanted this to go back to Eden where we were walking and talking with him. And it says that he's going to tabernacle with them. He's going to make his home with them. And if you guys understand about tabernacles, it's like little portable shelters. We're not talking about skyscrapers that are, you know, dug deep in the ground. These are He's going to go with you wherever you go and your home is going to be wherever he is. You know, we in fact, we have the little phrase, you know, home is where your heart is. Yeah. Yeah. Really? He he wants your heart? You already have his? And he wants to tabernacle with you wherever you go. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. You will never be forsaken. This is the reclaiming of paradise. Let's go next. So God sees us a certain way. This is his vision of us. This is First Peter. You are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings. A spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. And now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time, you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time, you knew nothing of God's mercy because you hadn't received it yet. But now you are drenched in it. Hallelujah. Do you see how much love he has for you? He wants all of you. In in another place, I believe it's in Hebrews, it says that he yearns jealously for you. Is that James? Sorry, I've read too much recently. (laughs) So he yearns jealously for you. He longs for you, all of you, not just a little part of you, not just a Saturday evening or Sunday morning or, you know, that devotion time period for ten minutes. Not that part of you. He wants all of you all the time. Could you imagine if you grew up and you got married and you only had your wife for 30 minutes a day? You only had a heart for 30 minutes? Sorry, dude. The rest of it's mine. Look, I've only known you a little while, you know. I don't think you're worth more than 30 minutes of time. Maybe an hour next year. Nobody would stand for that. Never. You pledge an unfailing love. Right? That's what God pledges to us. He paid it with his own blood. So, that brings us to seals. Now, this might seem like a bit of a departure from all that we've talked about thus far, but I'm hoping it'll come together on the end, so hang in there. He's reading Revelation, and it starts out with um, John seeing a vision of Messiah as a shepherd over churches. And he's walking among the lampstands, which are symbolic of the churches, and there are stars in his hand, which are the ministers of the shepherds of those churches. And he has messages to them, letters that he has John write down. And in those letters, they go sort of like this. I am, and then he describes himself, he reveals himself to the church, and then he says, I see this in you. It may be a positive or a negative thing, more often negative than positive. And he says, if you do, 
this or if you continue to persevere. So it's either repent if you did something, you're doing something wrong, or, and repent means what? Turn around, right. You're going the wrong way, turn around, come back. Okay? Either repent or keep persevering. I see what you're doing, you're doing fine, keep going. So that one of those two messages is given to the church. And if you conquer, then you will receive this blessing. Okay? And this is the format for every one of those letters. Then there is a revelation um, for John. He sees this scroll, which is the plan of God for humanity, this plan, to reclaim what was stolen from him. And he sees that it's the Lamb who is going to do that. It's very interesting. We noted last week that, the, I believe it was one of the elders said, look, it's the Lion of Judah. And John turns around, he looks, and he sees not the Lion of Judah, he sees the Lamb that was slain. Because it's different. Our perspective and heaven's perspective are different. Okay? So he sees the Lamb that was slain who is worthy to open the scrolls. And he picks up the scroll, and in chapter 6, we have, it's not up there, well, it will be later, but um, chapter 6, he says, Then I watched as the Lamb broke open the first of the seven seals, and immediately I heard one of the four living creatures call out with a powerful voice of revelation sounding like thunder, saying, Come forth! So I looked and behold, there was a bright white horse, its rider had a bow, and it was given a crown of victory. And he rode on as a conqueror ready to conquer. And this starts the opening of these seals. And with each opening, there's another little revelation that occurs. And as it unfolds, we're going to see where we're going with this. This is the Lord's determination to win this contested part of your body, of your being, for himself. Okay? But we've got to start with a vision of who it is that is winning our soul. All right? Now, because it's SEALs and my brain makes connections, I thought about the Navy SEALs. So, bear with me. It's just a metaphor for understanding, but I think you'll see it, okay? So, the Navy SEALs are, is the elite group of the Navy, right? They're the ones who do all the special missions and everything. And um, I, went, I got this straight off of their site, so this is true. Um, Entering training to become a Navy SEAL is voluntary. And so it is to give up your rights here. It's voluntary. God is not like Satan. He doesn't deceive. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't conjole. He doesn't guilt. He doesn't shame you into anything. That's not his manner of doing things. He wants all of you. He wants your whole heart. He asks for your whole heart. He deserves your whole heart. He is seeking to take dominion and to bring you back into oneness with him, but there's a problem with this. He can't just take you the way you are when you're dominated by sin in your flesh and bring you close to him because sin separates. Let me put it in a, a very practical manner. If you lie to your best friend about something, can you have a right relationship with that friend? No, you can't. Even if they don't know that you were lying, you know. There's a, a blockage there. You can't be open. You can try. You can pretend to talk to them. But something spiritually happened between you and your friend, and now there's something there. And they, if they're perceptive, will even know it. They'll be like, hey, dude, is there something wrong with you? Because you start doing things weird. They know. You know. There's a blockage. And so it is with God. He made us in his image, right? And so when there's sin between us and him, there's a blockage. You can't have open and free communication. 
Not until after that sin is taken care of. So God is going to go and He's going to get rid of the blockages between you and Him because He jealously yearns for your soul so that you can know Him and He can know you fully and you can enjoy communion fully. It is an act of love to remove those blockages. But you have to agree to the process. When He shows you something, you have to respond to that. To agree, yes, you're right, I did that wrong. And to repent and turn away from it. That's how you remove blockages in the spiritual realm. You acknowledge it. You confess it. You agree with God. And you repent. You turn away from it. And you say, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll go your way. And the blockage is removed. Okay? But you have to volunteer. All right. Officers and enlisted men train side side by side. I thought this was cool just because... There tends to be sort of a pride thing. You know, the officers are the ones who have it. And then there's the have-nots, the enlisted people. And the enlisted people sort of glory in their uh, being enlisted. Like, we're not snobby like the officers. And so they sort of are at odds with each other. But in this case... Hmm? To those who have no military understanding, the officers are like the management. They're the managers. The enlisted are the workhorse. They yep. are the ones that get down and dirty. Yep, and they each feel very proud of themselves. Yep. So, uh, White color, blue color. Yep, blue yep, they, they tend to be. But in this case, if you're a SEAL, you train side by side. Because they're like their whole little entity themselves. Okay? It is, they are not, now they're all, the, the playing field is leveled. Let's put it that way. And so it is with the Lord. When you choose to give Him everything of you and say, all right, rip me open, get rid of all the blockages, When you make that choice, it doesn't matter whether you came out of the church and have grown up all your life with great doctrine, great teaching, learning Bible stories and singing songs, or if you were the addict in the gutter. It doesn't matter where your background was from. You're on a level playing field. Everybody is lifted up. You do have certain requirements. Now, these are the requirements of the Navy SEAL. You have to be active duty Navy, if you're going to be a Navy SEAL. You have to be a U.S. citizen, if you're going to be a Navy SEAL. And so it is with the Lord. You must be His. You can't be a pagan or someone who doesn't acknowledge that God exists and come into union with Him without making that happen. You know, you've got to Square your allegiance to Christ, right? That wouldn't be foolish any other way. All right, second qualifications. Now, this is where we start to move off into other directions, and you'll see the graciousness of God's kingdom over the earthly kingdom. you got to be a man. Praise the Lord that God says that there is no male or female in his army, in his ranks. There's no male or female. you got to be 28 or younger, so you old people... Most of it, well, all of us just about are disqualified except for the kids. So, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that God still uses older people. <laughs> uh, and you have to have good vision. Too bad for those people who wear glasses. You know? Uh, so they have a couple of exceptions there. But it's, it's related on your ability to perform. Oh man, this is my favorite part of, of, God's qualifications because it's not based off of our performance to get close to the Lord. Let's go on to the next one. You also have to pass some testing. There's an ASVAB test, sort of like one of those bubble tests you got to do, and then you got to make sure you got a brain in your head. Okay? And then you have to do some physical screening. Um, none of those I could do from 500 yards in 12 and a half minutes or less. Follow the, do 42 push-ups and 50 sit-ups and yada, yada, yada. You gotta do all this physical stuff to prove you have the muscle and might to be a seal. Okay? Um, let's, <laughs> let's keep going. Alright. Thank the Lord we don't follow the same thing. Someone along the line, they, call, they termed God's kingdom as the upside down kingdom because it's so contrary to the way the world runs. The world runs based off of performance. You have to achieve a certain level, and if you don't, you sink. If you don't perform, you're no good. You're a failure. We'll reject you. We'll pass you over for the, for the uh, promotion. 
You'll fail your class. You won't be acceptable to your parents. You don't get to win the singing contest. Whatever it is, the, it's all about performance to somebody's standards, some other human standards. And if nobody's putting that on you, we have to have knack of doing it ourselves. We look around at other people and go, man, I'm not as good looking as that person. I don't have as good a voice as that person. And so we'll set up our own standards in the absence of somebody else forcing their standards on us. God's kingdom is different. His kingdom is based off of faithfulness and your relationship to him. And it's actually not your faithfulness to him. It's his faithfulness to you. How cool is that? You can't even screw that one up. It's screw up proof. I love it. All right, so there is, even among the religious, in fact, I would say especially among the religious, there is the sense that in order to be a person of God, let's put it that way, a person of God, that you have to do certain things. And so among the religious, they tend to feel like you have to be morally superior or have great will to win the battles for your soul. Okay? Because we're going to talk in terms of spiritual things. Moral fortitude. God says, no. You need to be humble. You need to be broken. God despises the proud, but he lifts up the humble. The, you know what humble means in Hebrew? It means afflicted beaten down, oppressed. Those who are in the dust, those are the ones he lifts up. It's not your great moral fortitude that wins God's favor. If it did, he would have been happy with Cain. Yeah. It's humility. Nor is it our strength. I have great talent and eloquence. I could preach the gospel to whoever. Or we feel bad about the fact that we don't have eloquence. Or we aren't as bold as we think we should be. Or we, we aren't able to, you know, I just wish I could minister and blah, 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 blah. And we make ourselves feel bad because we are looking at our human natural abilities. God says, no. It's in your weakness that I'm strong. It's in the foolishness that is in your body that I shame the entire world. It's my wisdom. I love the story of the uh, stuttering, stuttering Herbert Brown. The stuttering Herbert Brown. And he was uh, a guy, there was a, a pastor, James Stewart. He was an evangelist and he needed someone to come alongside him and help him preach because he was just too overwhelmed. And so he prayed. He said, Lord God, please send me someone else to help me. And so this stuttering Herbert Brown came up to him after one service and he says, you know, Mr. Stewart, I would like to, and he stuttered it, so imagine a person stuttering. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll have us do the reenactment here. <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite stories. Um, so after service, Dr. James Stewart, uh, who wrote she was only 22. I sent that out a little bit ago uh, of Helen Ewan. Dr. Uh, Herbert Brown said, Dr. Stewart, praise the Lord. I am going to go preach with you. He's answered my prayer. And Dr. Stewart said, oh, no, 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 no. Lord, Lord Jesus, no, no, no. And the Lord rebuked him. He said, Son, I, did I not make him too? And as they went out preaching, Dr. James Stewart, a man of God who is so accomplished, uh, died in 1976 or something, went all over the world, lots of publications. He said that that man, Dr. Uh, 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 Brother Herbert Brown, was more anointed than me. Scores of people got saved. If you ever get a chance to look up on YouTube, uh, I am second yes. David Ring. Oh, here goes the waterworks. <laughs> and you hear a man who was born dead, a cripple, cerebral palsy, came back to life, gave his life to the Lord at 14, and now goes all over the country preaching, and scores of people are getting saved. 
God uses broken people. Amen. Um, another qualification. Um, sometimes people think that they have to have a lot of scripture knowledge. Like you got to have memorized large chunks of the Bible or at least the plan of salvation and all the verses that go with it. Or maybe it's certain doctrines you have to have a handle on or a special sort of spiritual sensitivity. Maybe you'd be able to hear God's voice real well or whatever, whatever that sounds like. And so people will elevate these things and think that, that they are disqualified from being a person of God because they don't sense those characteristics in their life. The Bible never teaches that. He says, the Bible says you have to have faith in God and you have to believe in His Word and rely on it. You've got you to do what He says. You've got to rely on what He says and speak what He says about you. And I have a little testimony on this myself. When we were first married, we decided we were going to learn Scripture. We just thought that that was really important. We were going to memorize it. So we started re memorizing 1 Corinthians 13. Figured that was a good one to start with, love and all that. And so we would read a little phrase, and I'd repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. I'd repeat it standing up like I was preaching it to someone. And then um, I would add the next phrase the next day. And we'd do it, Eris and I would do it together. And, and at the end of the day, we'd like quiz each other and the whole deal. I stunk at it. I could not for the life of me remember scripture. I just couldn't do it. I tried. I tried. I can remember crying before the Lord and being like, what's wrong with me? You know, maybe I have a demon or something. I can't, I can't memorize scripture. I really felt horrible about it. And then as I went along, I finally stopped. I said, Lord, you said that you would write the word on my heart. So, Lord, would you just do it? Would you just do what you said and write the word on my heart? Because I want to know your word, but I can't remember it. And he did. And now I remember lots of scripture. I don't always have the references, but I remember the scripture. And he has written it on my heart. Um, by the way, if anybody knows me, I don't remember a lot of things. So this is just like my brain just doesn't work this way. But I know his word. Glory. Because he does what he says. He's faithful. Amen. Some people think you need a certain level of emotional heat. You know, you ever meet those charismatic people? And I'm not talking about the denomination. I'm talking about like someone who's just really likable, has a lot of fire in their bone. So the sort of the purest sense of the word charismata. And sometimes people think that's what's necessary in order to be truly on fire for God. You've got to have that emotional heat and fervor. God says you need to have passion like Christ. A deep commitment, even to death, if necessary. To cling on to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what you need. You need that passion. It's not necessarily a visible heat, but it's a deep, deep commitment. A loyalty. That's what you need. Now, the beautiful thing about these qualifications is that everyone can have all of these qualifications. Everybody can be humble before God and be teachable. Everyone is weak. We can just recognize it. Everyone can have faith in God and what He has said, believe it, speak it, and rely on His Word and not our own understanding. Everyone can have a deep commitment to the Lord. And that's all that's required for you to become a 100% devoted to the Lord. And this part of your soul, will the victory will be won progressively. Now I want to remind you of what God said to Joshua and to Moses. As the people of Israel, you know, they came out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery... And they were headed to the promised land. The promised land would give them a home and security and rest. It's always been a picture of Eden, sort of in the physical sense. And they would have homes there, and, and they would no longer be oppressed by another nation. The problem is, is that land was full of a whole bunch of pagan peoples, Canaanites and Hivites and Perizzites and Tetracites and Lagawites and all the other ites that could be there. 
And they had to be driven out in order for them to have rest in their land because those people were not happy having Israel just come in and say, you know, guys, you should leave now. And so, yeah, they, they didn't like that. And so uh, there was going to be some battles that were going to occur. This is a huge metaphor for us, okay, because we have things living within our soul that are contrary to God and they don't want to just get up and leave, okay? Those old habits, those old patterns have been rooted in there since, you know, the beginning of our life. And they don't want to just say, oh, yeah, you're right, you know, we'll go, see you later. You know, that doesn't go like that. I wish it did, but it doesn't. And so there's going to be some fights. But God tells Joshua some things before they go into the land to take over the land. He says, I will go before you. That's really important. I'm going to win the victory for you. That's also very important. However, Joshua's going to have to go, so it's a community or a communion thing. Also, he says, I'm going to drive them out. How? Anybody know? By little. Little by little. Not at one fell swoop. Not in even one year. So be patient. It's going to take some time. Because I don't want the wild beast to grow up in you. Wild beast. That is the, the God's way of saying your flesh nature. To spring up. You've got to, we've got to drive it out little by little. And then you will possess the land and there will be rest. There will be rest for your souls. Your souls. Interesting that he uses that. Alright. Ooh, that sounded bad. But, no worries. Alright. The one thing left that qualifies you to become a person of God, and I, I, I hope I'm getting this across. There are people who believe that Jesus died and rose again for them and that they're going to heaven, and they have a relationship with God at a level. And then there are people who live it and breathe it 24 hours a day. I hope you have had an experience of seeing the difference between the two. Okay? There are people who, who you would look at and you go, man, they really know God. In fact, if you have a spiritual question, those are the people you're going to go to. You just sort of know. They, if anybody knows, they're going to be the ones who know. Okay? So those are the people I'm talking about. And then there's the people who sort of do church sometimes. And then they do other stuff other times. Okay? When you become a SEAL, and I'm talking about the Navy SEALs, you become a SEAL 24-7. It's not part of the time. You don't take off your SEAL uniform and hang it up and, and you become a civilian after that. You are a SEAL 100% of the time. In fact, you're not even just part of the Navy. You're part, you are a SEAL trainee or someone who has, has gone through the training and you're done. Okay? It's 100% of the time. And so it is with the Lord. When you say, Lord, I want you to be master of my life 100% of the time, you never take it off. You can't go back to being a civilian any longer. There's a little clip I want to show. It's called Don't Ring the Bell. And this is um, the admonition that once you start, once you have made the decision to say, Lord, all of you, you can have all of me. When you make that decision... Everything will come against you. You will be tried in every way because Satan hates it. He hates it with a passion when people make that statement. And he'll do everything to deter you. He's going to try you physically, circumstantially, emotionally. He will try to badger you and tell you you won't make it. And he'll try to get you to give up because he knows that God has already won the war through Christ. That the victory is sure. But if he can get you to believe that it won't work for you, maybe it works for other people, but it won't work for you, then he's won. He's won not because he has made you lose, but because you have given up. And so this is actually from Admiral William McRaven. He was given a talk at the end of somebody's... Um, Long born graduation. Thank you. Um, and so this is part of his talk. It's a two-minute clip. But he's talking about the difficulties of SEAL training and what they're trying to do as well 
um, to only get those who are going to be truly loyal. Okay? Two minute clip. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. Wow. SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. And that's the admonition of the Lord to us. Don't ring the bell. If you read Revelation through, you'll see over and over again it says that those who conquered clung tightly to the word of the Lord and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. They didn't ring the bell. Philadelphia and Smyrna didn't ring the bell. And when Jesus came to them, his admonition to them was persevere, hold on. I know you are being persecuted. I know you're going through struggles. I know you're going through difficulties. Hold on. Or don't ring the bell. Don't give up. And those who survive, they get to the end of Revelation as the bride. The beautifully adorned one with the white shining robes who is the apple of God's eye. And what do you see the bride doing in that last chapter of Revelation? The spirit and the bride say, come. come. Let those who are thirsty say, they say, come. Right? The whole point is that when you become fully his, you have his heart, you have his mind, you have his power by the Holy Spirit and the authority of Christ has been shared with you so that you can interact in the world and do something that makes a difference. You know, why do people become Navy SEALs? Because they want to make a difference. They, they want to do something of importance. They want to be the best. Should we not want at least as much as a Navy SEAL on this earth for God's kingdom? Shouldn't we want to be all of his and say, I don't have much, but you can have all that I am. And let him decide what your life looks like. Let him decide how to write your story. So we have a picture here in Revelation 6, a new one of Jesus. It is... Um, spoken out by one of the four creatures that's flying around God's throne. 
before God's throne. These are the creatures that have the multiple wings and the faces that are different, you know, an ox and an eagle and a lion and a man. Okay, it's a picture of all creation. Four of them, like the four corners of the earth. And, you know, Paul says that all of creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Who's going to take up the call? Who's going to say, I'm all in? And all of creation is hoping, looking for who's going to take up the call. And so it's one of these four that says, come forth. And John looks, and he sees, behold. Can you send me over? Sorry. There was a bright white horse, and its rider had a bow and was given a crown of victory. That's because he already won over sin and death. He already had that crown. He's on a white horse, purity. As a conquering king, he rode out as a conqueror already. And he was ready to conquer. He conquered and he will conquer. What's he conquering? The battle for the soul. Just as he said to Joshua thousands of years prior, I will go before you and drive them out. He will go before you in your soul, that territory that is contested, and drive everything that is keeping you from intimate communion with him out. And just in case you're not sure if this is actually Jesus, Revelation 19 shows us the same picture. When I saw he- then I saw heaven opened and suddenly a white horse appeared. Sound familiar? The name of the one riding on it was faithful and true. It's his faithfulness, not ours. And with pure righteousness, he judges and he rides to battle. He will look into your life and he will judge it. Just like he did with those churches. He looked into the church and he judged them. And he said, you did good. You did not so good. Fix the not so good. Repent. Turn around. And when you conquer, you will gain. He wore many regal crowns. Remember our first image was he had a victor's crown. Now he has many crowns. Why many? I believe it's all the souls that he led through this process where he had overcome here. He conquered. He conquered. He conquered. His eyes were flashing like flames of fire. We know that our God is a consuming fire. Burns up anything that's not of himself. Leaving you refined and pure like he is. He had a secret name inscribed on him that was known only to himself. And he wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was called the Word of God. I love this section in Pilgrim's Progress, Progress the little animated one. Yeah, Pilgrim's going to cross that water. Right? And he goes in and just as Apollyon said, he said, I'll see you at death's door, right? I will see you again, right? And so the great serpent comes in and he, there's a, a biting, it looks like he bit him. And, and Christy goes, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. And he gets up, he, he finds himself on the shore and the king is standing over him. And he said, but I was bleeding. And the king says, that was my blood. Woo! It's a robe dipped in blood. His blood. That's what gives him the victory over sin and death. And that's what gives you the victory over your soul. Amen. And his title is called the Word of God. Amen. 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 Following him on white horses. This is what happened to all those people who went through that training. They follow him now on white horses, the armies of heaven, wearing white, fine linen, pure and bright, just like, shall we say, the picture of the bride, the picture of the 144,000 who have the name and image of God on their forehead that are marked and sealed for him, the saints that are under the throne. They're all the same picture. Fine white linen clothes them. 
A sharp sword comes out of his mouth from which to conquer the nations, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will trample out the wine and the wine press of the wrath of God, and on his robe and on his thigh he has inscribed, inscribed a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Certainly he is king over every earthly reign that, that is here. But remember, we are all promised that we will be kings after him. He is our king over a whole nation of kings who rule in his stead. That's what Adam was supposed to do. He was supposed to take dominion over the earth. So this is Jesus, our conqueror. We have a promise, a promise of victory. Joshua tells, uh, it, it tells us of how God promises to him. When you go into the promised land, you're going to have a victory. Be strong. Be courageous. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to take you through to the completion. It's akin to Jesus saying, I'm the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and Omega. It's the same thing. I'm going to take you all the way to the end. What I planned on doing for you, I will complete. Or, Paul puts it this way, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Right? And so this is what he's going to do for us. Haven't I commanded you to be strong and courageous? God speaks to Joshua. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he speaks the same thing to us. doesn't matter what circumstance you have to go through, what trials, what difficulty, what persecution, what voice you have to fight in your head. I will go with you, and I promise you the victory. And he gave us a special equipping. In John 14, 16 to 18, he says, Jesus says to his disciples, this is right before he's going to be crucified. These are his like last words. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give to you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. Very important, because Satan is the father of lies. And we still live in a world that is run by the father of lies. And there's lots of lies all over the place. So God gives us a special equipping, a spirit of truth, so that we can discern between the truth and the lie. The world and its system is unable to receive the spirit of truth because it doesn't see him or know him. It's not of him. But you do know him because he remains with you and he will be inside of you. That was the promise in Ezekiel, remember? In Ezekiel 36, 26, I will put my spirit within you so that you can have victory. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. We are especially equipped for this SEAL training. It is up to you. It is up to you to make a decision to give all you have to the king and say, make me all yours. It is not dependent on your flesh. It's dependent on God's word about you. He will do it in you if you are willing to volunteer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful message. Thank you so much that you are the lover of our souls. You are the conquering king. You have won our hearts. Oh God, I pray that we would relinquish what we're holding on to. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
O oh God, show us how to do it. Teach us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I'm going to give an altar call. Um, it's, it's based on, that ties into this. The Lord showed me something incredible. Okay. Mark 5, verse 41. This is, I'll give you the backdrop. Jesus walking through the marketplace. Jairus, or rather in Hebrew, Yair. I, I love the name. Um, uh, Yahweh is my light. And he says, come, my, my daughter is at the point of death. And then she dies. Oh, glory. He goes in. Peter, James, and John are with him. And he says, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Folks, you're not dead. You're sleeping. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're sleeping. Arise and wake, O oh sleeper! God is saying, get with it! We are in a war for men's souls. Quit doing your own thing. Stop living like the world six days a week and come on Shabbat or Sunday or whatever thinking you can give God your heart, give God your offering and say, hey, what a great Christian I am. May God have mercy on all of us. He came to call sick ones. Spoken. Let him break you. Jesus says, Talitha Kum. That's interesting why it says Kum. In the Hebrew, and similar to Aramaic, there's masculine and feminine forms. Talitha is feminine. Kum is masculine. Huh? He's referring to masculine. Talitha, the Lord showed me, is a, a name wrapped up with so many meanings. Jesus came to set you free from the wickedness. I had sexual addiction all my life. Depression, wanted to commit suicide. I was exposed to pornography at the age of eight. It ran through my house. Didn't know any different. Jesus set me free in 2003. But then I fell into another trap. Trying to be good for God. Do good things for God. You can't do it. You can't please Him. The best thing you can give to him, he says, that's not to me. I don't want it. I want it my way. I want it my way. Not only did he die for your wickedness, drugs, gambling, drink, he died for even the good things that you think you can give to him. I'm trying to obey you. Flies in the face of a spiritual climate that we're in, thinking that if I can do this thing, God accepts me. No, He doesn't. He accepts you because of the blood on the cross. That's why He accepts you. Because He says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I was guilty. I thought if I could keep Shabbat, obey certain rules, do it a certain way, I'd be okay. No. God said, I, I fell into the trap. And I tried to share with people Oh, you're not doing this right. Look, it's so good to obey Him. That's legalism, folks. That's actually worse than the drug dealer, pimp, prostitute. That's worse. Because you think that you have favor with God. In fact, God says, I hate it. He totally came. He didn't even look at His offering. Folks, it's sin. I, I spoke with a dear brother yesterday um, as, as we've been connecting with pastors. a lot of the Jewish hardness, uh, the Jewish people, my people in the flesh, why they don't come to Christ readily. It's opening. It's changing. Because they think they have the oracles of God. And they, hey, we're fine. How dare you 
unbeliever, person who never got the Bible, not part of Israel, thinks that you could tell me, one who is of Israel, that I am doing it wrong. I'm okay. Pride in the nth degree. Wrong. I had it. Folks, I'm a living testimony. I did the Jewish stuff. I did it from the Christian perspective. And I did not the love of Jesus. I did not have love. I did not have grace. I couldn't keep Shabbat to save my life. I couldn't keep the peace to save my life. It's Jesus. It's His blood. It's His love. You can't earn it. You can't do anything for it. Just say, I love Jesus. I believe that wash me clean. He says to you with Talitha, that word in the Hebrew, there's different variations. It says, let alone wake up. Let alone wake up. Wake up. Why do little lambs? Why are we his lambs? Because you go to the cross with him. You go to the cross with him. You go to the doctor. You come and die. Say to yourself. So waste another moment. So, anything for God that you think you can do in your own ideas and rumors is going to fail. Unless it's broken. Unless it comes through to your brokenness. Don't even think you can do anything for him. Be broken. Let him break you. Tell us the seal training. I understand. Some people don't understand the military. Sorry. Last time I checked, every authority put here on earth, God put it in place. It's for your protection. I'm ex-military. I don't agree with a lot of things they do. Your organization is helpful. Good job, Jenny. <laughs> but it's a picture. If you win, you get to earn the title. It's not, I'm not, I'm not, let me back up. I don't want to make this sound like you're earning favor. You're not. God says, I'm willing. If you're willing to go with me all the way, let me break you. You're not, this is not, you can't determine what he does to you. You have to let him do it in you and to you. You can't determine it. So I'm going to go out to the Sentinelese people and get killed just like John Allen Chow. No, why don't you put on your wife's shoes? Because right now she's bedridden. Right now she, she has a hard time. Why don't you serve your wife? Why? Why don't you be kind to your husbands? Love them. If he says, honey, I think we should jump off cliffs. On a parachute. Yes, yes, sure thing, honey. I would love to talk to you a little more if that's okay. Honey, we, we need to go this way. Okay. And let God protect you. Now, it sounds a little ridiculous. But, honey, I think we need to sell our house and move to California. Sure, honey. I trust you. I trust the Lord has this. Assuming you've gone to the Lord. Because God is working in you as you are learning to give your husband over. Honey, I think we need to put an end to this per relationship with this person in our lives. He's, he's not helpful. Okay. What about certain thought patterns? Why don't you speak good of one another? Why don't you speak life? Instead of criticizing. Folks, that's the transformation process of having the mind of Christ. So, Father in Heaven, thank You for Your Word, teaching us, refining us. Jesus, there's somebody at the sound of my voice that has not denied themselves, taken your cross, and followed you. They're still trying to do it their own way, pulling up their own bootstraps. Father, cut the bootstraps. Take off the boots. Let them walk barefooted so that they learn how to be like Sadhu Sundar Singh, the apostle with bleeding feet, to just follow you, saying, yes, Lord, you provide for me. You take care of me. 
whatever. Let me just know your voice, Jesus, because that's more, that's better to me than life. Your love to me is better than life. In Jesus' name, amen.